Hey, uh, be my alarm tonight. We're, I'm going to stop at 1900 on the dot tonight. So at seven o'clock on the dot. And then if there's any questions, we could chat a little bit, but we'll end at 1900. I'll keep my word tonight because we went till 1930 last time. I mean, like, questions about the course, Marv. <laughs> I don't know. They, they have a recovery group tonight. The Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. I had, speaking of that, I had a kid on my football team a couple of years ago. You'd remember, I can't remember his name now. I said, any questions, guys? And he goes, yes. Is pro wrestling fake? I was like, No. Are there any questions about football? <laughs> so, you guys, as we start to explore the Reformation and we look at the center of what Luther's reform was all about, you start to realize very swiftly that it deals more with, it deals more than with just indulgences. When you see any historian or any person that looks at Reformation history or they look at the impact or the significance of the Protestant Reformation, Almost everyone talks about indulgences, and they think that that was the chief sort of criticism or objection that Luther and the Protestants had to, Roman, the Roman, to the Roman Catholic Church at that time, which was indulgences, which is why in our lifetime, there's a lot of Protestants that, and Mike will be familiar with this, there's, there's a lot of Protestant groups that involve themselves in what's called let's go home to Rome movement very prominent in, in Anglican circles, very prominent in Lutheran circles. And so they think that since the indulgence thing now has been rectified, then let's, it's time to go back to one church, back to, the, back to the Roman Catholic Church. This is stupid history. Luther's objection was not just one, was not just one thing that relates to the medieval scholastic Catholic what I would say, semi-Pelagian system, he wasn't just attacking one thing, he was attacking the system, the whole thing. And indulgences were basically like his, what, little piece of yarn that he pulled on the quilt that started to get him into the whole quilt. Does that make sense? Anyone you talk to, you could talk to Catholic scholars or even priests and People who think they know about the Reformation, they say, well, Luther just was a... I had a conversation with a guy up at Bellarmine, our, the athletic director. We were talking about the Reformation, and he asked uh, this guy I was talking with, what are you talking about? We said, we're Martin Luther and the Reformation. He goes, oh, quitters. You guys are a bunch of quitters. Did you say, oh, wait, yeah, which I said, okay, heretic. You know, I mean, we could play this game. <laughs> but it's the system, and... Luther's criticism of the system and his emphasis on the gospel not only made their heads spin and made their brains fall apart, they can't conceive of it, it makes Protestants' brains fall apart. Because, as, as, as I mentioned, this will be familiar to you, Doc, is that we begin to see the law as the way of salvation. We can't fulfill it. Jesus Christ comes in, fulfills the law for us, so to speak, in a, way that's, in a way that's unbiblical. And now, what we couldn't fulfill before with the help of Jesus Christ, now we can fulfill, one, now we can fulfill because of Jesus Christ and its law from front to back. The system of salvation is built on law. Do you see what I'm saying? The, 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 the thing that runs salvation is the law. Jesus Christ is like an add-on that helps us now do it. The whole structure, though, is still salvation by law. Whether, whether Jesus helps you or you do it yourself, whether it's Pelagian, semi-Pelagian, legalistic, either way. Luther struck at this whole system, and it makes our brains scramble. And that's what we're still, deal what we're still dealing with today. Um, so what I want to do is open up, uh, take a peek at our slides. Um, just a quick recap. 
On the left is the topic that we're looking at in the Reformation, the topic of justification. And you probably get, have been sick of me saying this, but for Luther's statement was justification is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. It is the doctrine above all doctrines. If you get justification wrong, you get Christianity wrong. On the, le on the middle column, that is what you consider like Luther, Protestant Lutheran theology, and on the right would be medieval scholastic Catholicism, heavily influenced by Thomas Aquinas uh, and, and the nominalists such as Beale and Duns Scotus. We're going to look at this in detail. Just to recap, though, it is, look, the middle column for Luther, justification is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. If you miss justification, it doesn't matter what your Christology is. It doesn't matter what your soteriology is. It doesn't matter what your ecclesiology is. It doesn't matter how great you are at church history. It doesn't matter how good of an exegete you are at interpreting scripture. If you get justification wrong, you get Christianity wrong. It's the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. For the Catholic church, as for many denominations, it just happens to be one doctrine among many. For Luther, the doctrine of justification was forensic. Do you see that word there? Which means it's declarative. That means you're declared righteous for Christ's sake. It's a forensic declaration, like in a courtroom, where we get that term forensic from. I told you, I talked with a lawyer about that term. For the Catholic Church, based on the Thomistic system, that is Thomas Aquinas, who, by the way, built his whole theological system. Thomas Aquinas is called, how many of you have heard of Thomas Aquinas before? Outside of like about a high school or a grammar school. Um, didn't your mom go to Thomas Aquinas High School, Kim? Uh, Thomas Aquinas wrote his great, what's called the Summa Theologia. And what's Summa mean? The big, the all-encompassing, the, the magnum opus, the, the all of theology. And Thomas, do you, he, he was, Thomas was brilliant. He built his whole theological system off the philosophy of a Greek philosopher, from about a thousand years, 1200 years prior, named Aristotle. And so Aristotle had been lost during the Dark Ages. He is, he's sort of found and becomes popularized again. And Thomas Aquinas basically takes Aristotelian philosophy and melds it together with Christian theology. Remember Aristotelian philosophy, Aristotle, the oak is hidden in the acorn. It's based on you, you being a stupid little acorn and trying to transform you into an oak. And you, we pull the potential out of you. For the Catholic Church at that time, rather than forensic, justification was effective. Can anyone define that for us? What does effective mean? It's no good unless it affects something. Are yeah. Are you changing? Are you growing? Are you getting better? And if not, justification is ineffective. It doesn't work. Third point, it is by faith alone through grace. For the, cap, mid, for the scholastic system, it is by grace. And the way they define grace is this. Through the sacraments, you will receive grace like fuel, which gives you now energy and gives you juice to fulfill the law. For Luther, it was by faith alone through grace. And he didn't define grace as juice or gas, gasoline to get your moral uh, engine running, grace means like God's unconditional favor and love upon you, uh, lo loving the unlovely. Uh, when we were sinners, Christ Jesus died for you. That's grace. Righteousness is imputed for the sake of Christ, whereas for the imputed means it's given over to you. It's Christ's righteousness. For the Catholic Church, righteousness was acquired through acts of love. You become more and more righteous the more and more you obey and the more and more you, you, you observe the mandatory days that you have to go to Mass. You go to confession, you take the sacrament, you work at the soup kitchen, and righteousness gets acquired. It's, justification is effective. And for Luther, he says, how do you get justification? He, believed, he said it happened through the proclamation of the gospel and in the sacrament, which is just a visible, visible words, that God's grace and love come through those things as through vessels, through means. For the Catholic Church, it comes through moral transformation. So you see, 
Th those, are, those aren't, as my teacher Gerhard Ferdi said, those aren't two different ways of looking at Christianity. Those are two different religions right there. Those aren't the same thing, correct? I mean, one, 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 one of those sides puts a lot back into moral transformation as the basis of proving or affecting your justification. One gives justification all on the side of Jesus Christ apart from works of the law. Now, whenever you say apart from works of the law, which the Apostle Paul did, people start to poop. And they start to think, well, I mean, you know, which I, I did too. I mean, I wrangled with this. What is my part in this? What about these scripture passages that say we have to do this and we have to do this and we have to do this? Um, you begin to see that one's understanding, the first, the, the first thing that changes when one understands the gospel is is that they begin to reevaluate or they, they, they have to reimagine or not reimagine. You have to change how you look at the law. What, was, what, did, what did God give the law for? That's what you have to get to. And we looked at this last week, Mike, where the law was given, God gave the law for, gave the law for two reasons. One is for civil righteousness. And then Luther called it the theological use. One is for just to restrain evil in this old world. So when Christ comes again, right, and take, or takes us home and we're in the world to come, is there going to be any need for this first function or use of the law anymore? The answer is no. You don't need, to, you don't need the law to restrain evil in heaven. Do we need to drive people to Christ by showing them their sin and bringing them to the brink of despair so that they will put their trust and their hope in Christ their Savior? No. That means the law was given for this world, not for the world to come. That means, you guys, that the law was never given by God to save you. And so that requires a totally rewiring of our theological brains to start to think about. It scrambled me when I was at seminary. I just didn't know how to think about it. I, I didn't have the categories because all of my categories were solely based on salvation by law. That's how, that's how I, I, I'm categorized that way from birth in everything that I've done and especially in relationship to God. We can't think outside of those categories. That's why it scrambles us. It's like, what? what? When Luther got into a debate with Erasmus in 1525, Erasmus wrote a treatise on, they ended up arguing about the will. What is the function of the will? But Erasmus, Luther said that Erasmus looks at the gospel like a cow looks at a new gate. It can't. It just can't. Moon. There's a new gate. It's wide open and they don't go because it's never been there before. He didn't, they, they, we can't think it. It's beyond our categories. We can't think this thing. Um, and so, if the law was never given to save, why do we use it for salvation then? Well, see, that's the question. It, look at it. The logic of the gospel is very simple. If God had to send Jesus Christ to save you, that means you can't save yourself. The logic is very simple. This is why Eberhard Jungle in his book, did my wire, did my screen go out here? Yep. Uh-oh. We lost the screen. Do you guys have the sheet with you? Yes. Yeah, it's gone. The screen is gone. Dag nabbit. When did it disappear? Did you see when it... Okay. It is? How do you know? Oh, Andrew, I thought it was someone down here. Okay. So let's take, let's take your sheet, you guys. Pull that out. And I want you to take a look at, we've gone through justification. And I want us to look at the differences between the reformers. Does everyone have this, by the way? You recalcitrant student, Bruce, you did not bring yours from last time. We should get Catholic school and wrap your knuckles. Darren, could you? And I want to show you, you guys, so if you have your sheet, open it up to the back of the first page. 
Lest you think I'm like making this stuff up. So do you see I'm on the back of the first page here? So if you look at justification, what the Augsburg Confession, this is from the, the, the evangelicals, that's what the Lutherans called themselves, this is what the Augsburg Confession says, that men cannot be justified by God by their own strength, merits, or works, but are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. This is a long sentence. Who by his death has made satisfaction for our sins. This faith God imputes for righteousness in his sight. Now flip over to the Council of Trent on the other side. This is the, the council that took place right after Luther's death. The Catholic Church said, For faith, unless hope and charity be added thereto, neither unites man perfectly with Christ, nor makes him a living member of his body, for which reason it is most truly said that faith without works is dead and profitless. Those are two different things. Both can't be right. Are you seeing what I'm looking at here, fellas and ladies? Both of those can't be right. Further, go back to Luther on the bottom. It's right here. Yes, thank you. Since God has not commanded works as a means of being reconciled to him. Oh, see what he said? Has God commanded works as a means to be reconciled to him? This shocked me when my teacher at seminary said this. If that were true, if God had commanded works as a means by which we're reconciled to him, you are no different than a Muslim. You're no different than an Orthodox Jew. You're no different than a Hindu. You're no different than a Buddhist in some sense. What's the difference? You know, there's a story about C.S. Lewis. And there was a, you know, he taught at a little sub-college of uh, Oxford University called uh, Magdalene, like Mary Magdalene. But it's, if you're British, you pronounce it Moodlin, like that. I don't know why British are weird, the way they say stuff. It's not water, it's water, you know. It's, there was a conference going on, and Lewis walked into the conference, and uh, it, the, the, the title of the conference was, What Makes Christianity Distinct or Different or Unique or Peculiar from Every Other Religion in the World? And that's what they were debating. And Lewis came in and he says, so what are you guys uh, debating? And they said, what makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world? And Lewis looks at them and he goes, oh, that's easy. It's grace. And then he walked out. That's the difference. Either God is the agent of salvation and accomplishes it, or you have a part to play and you are the agent of salvation, but both can't be right. One is God's doing, the other is ours. So, to Luther again, right here. Since God has not commanded works as a means of being reconciled to him, but rather as a means to serve our neighbor, doing works with the intention of reconciliation with God is not only useless, useless but it's also an insult to God. This is what got him absolute. This is, you guys, this is when the popes and the cardinals and the archbishops started to hear this. This is when they started peeing down their leg is because not only did he say works do not merit a salvation, but if you are doing them in the spirit where you think they do, you are doubly sinning. You're sinning with your good works. That was the point when Luther stressed this, specifically in 1518 at the Heidelberg Disputation, when word of that got back to Rome, they flipped. That even doing good work, and it's very simple. All you need to do is go read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and you see lots of people who think that because they obey God, they're somehow gaining or earning or meriting. And how did Jesus talk to those people? They're called Pharisees. How did he talk to them? With extreme sharpness of tongue. Look at, not only is God not pleased by them, he is even offended. Grace cannot stand it when we want to give God or pay him with our works. This is the greatest of blasphemies and is nothing less than ridicule of God. So my teacher, Gerhard Ferdi, said, God has two problems with you. <laughs> he stole this from Luther, but listen, God has two problems with you. One is your immorality, right? Duh, that's every religion. Like, be a better person. You, you kind of suck. You know, you do drugs, you steal stuff, you cheat on your wife. God has a problem with that. That's called immorality. 
And you know what God's second problem is? Your morality. That's what Luther is talking about here as a means of self-salvation. Go over to the Catholic side. Second paragraph. No one, moreover, so long as he is in this mortal life, ought so far to presume as regards the secret mystery of divine predestination as to determine for certain that he's assuredly in the number of the predestinate. As if it were true that he that is justified either cannot sin anymore or if he does, does sin, that he ought to promise himself an assured repent, repentance. For except by special revelation, it cannot be known whether God, whom God has chosen unto himself. And then look at what Luther says on the last, the last line. On the last day, he, last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. What's the difference there? Correct. Absolutely correct. The difference is certainty. When salvation is, in, is somehow or another left with you, you have to talk like a medieval scholastic. You will never know. How do you know whether you've done enough? How do you know whether you've fully done enough? Truly, honestly, passionately, you never know. And at least, at least the Council of Trent is direct enough to say, if you consider yourself that you know you are saved, that's impossible because you never know whether you've obeyed enough. So keep trying harder. At least they say that. And the Protestant Reformation, Luther in particular, says, on the last day he will raise me and all the dead and give to me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. One is certainty, one is not. Whenever a salvation is based upon works, you will live in uncertainty and you will never know. When salvation is based upon grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone, you have utter and complete certainty because the work rests with him and not with you. The logic is simple. Then why is it so hard to understand? Why, what do you think? Think about it this way. I'm going to build on Mike's point here. Think about it this way. And this is a great way to think about it. If God, let's, let's think from above here. Why did God have to send Jesus Christ? Now, did he send Jesus Christ to teach us things that we could do better in order to reach nirvana or reach salvation? Did did Jesus, did Jesus Christ teach things as a means by which we can ascend out of Plato's cave and somehow come out of the realm of the shadows and into the realm of the light? Salva did Jesus, does the New Testament teach salvation by works? No. Well, that's what that is. That's what I just described. So what did God do? He sent Jesus Christ. And that means if he sent Jesus Christ first as what? We talked about the first thing that the angel said to the shepherds, what they called him. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. There, that's the first thing that Jesus Christ is described as publicly in the Gospel of Luke. So, correct, Charlie Brown. So that means that Jesus Christ was sent to save. He wasn't first sent as a guru. He wasn't first sent as a new age spiritual philosopher. He wasn't a sage. He wasn't just a rabbi. He wasn't just a new Moses. He was sent to be a savior, which implies what about us? That you need saving. Times two, Times two right? That means that you can't save yourself. If we could save ourselves, Gerhard Ferdi used to say, if we have the capabilities to save ourselves, what the hell is Jesus Christ doing on the cross? And this is why a wonderful 20th century theologian, which this, this name you should know, Karl Barth, B-A-R-T-H. Barth said, the mere fact that Jesus Christ had to come is the direct implication of our guilt, of our state of our, we can't save ourselves. The fact that he's here is an indictment of our, of, of our, we're incapable of saving ourselves. So thus you need a savior. The logic is simple. Okay. 
So if Jesus Christ is sent primarily as Savior for us, that means we can't save ourselves. So in that way, that's God's diagnosis. That's not mine. That's not his. That's not Faith International. It's not your church's diagnosis of the situation. That is the situation. And there's no debate on that. And, and you know what? No Christian denomination would debate that. Okay, well, let's work, let's work on the logic then. Then if that's the state we're in, what's the state? Incapable of salvation. Well, then how do we define this? Because that's the thing that God's rescuing us out of. What is that? Now, if you're like, high school and college Danny Shaw, he would say, well, that's cursing and that's stealing and blah, blah, blah. You know, how would you define that term? Sin. Yeah, see, you're going deeper there, right? See, I always thought it was cursing when I was a kid. My parents always said, you know, cursing is a sin, so I thought cursing was the sin, right? This is why Jesus Christ went to the cross is because Dan can't stop saying shit. And that's all, all of my curse words, my F words, my S words, all of them are on the cross of Jesus Christ. And I thought that that meant the salvation of Jesus Christ is, well, I wasn't even sorry for those for, for the most part, right? Not only did I sin that way, I actually intended to, and I liked saying those words, furthermore. And even if I had remorse over them, that, that doesn't seem like much of a salvation is that Jesus Christ just saved it. God seemed pretty petty if I'm going to go to hell because I just said shit. That doesn't seem like much of a salvation. It doesn't seem like much of a forgiveness. And he doesn't seem like much of a loving God that would, if I said S-H-I-T, that separates me from him eternally. That seems pretty stupid. Okay, well, you know, I, when, I was, when I was in eighth grade, I initiated an experiment with salvation. My parents always told me that when you go to the Lord's Supper, that in the Lord's Supper, your sin gets forgiven. And so at, at the church where, where I was a little boy, we only had the Lord's Supper every other week. So not every Sunday. So I remember thinking, I had been a really bad boy on the Skyline Elementary playground with my mouth. And I thought, okay, I need to get this cleaned up. Because I actually was feeling remorse over it at this time. Not anymore, obviously. But I... <laughs> So I said, I'm going to go take communion, and then I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to not sin for the next two weeks in such a way that I won't even need communion in two weeks. I am not going to cuss once. So I remember that Sunday at Emmanuel Lutheran Church, this is, and I was like, not in the eighth grade, excuse me, I was like in the fourth grade, and I remember going up, taking communion. I was like, it's the beginning of the experiment. Go, starts now. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Took it. Made the holy gestures. I got good works going now, too. Walked off, and as I'm walking off back and back to my pew, to my chair in church, you know what my mind is doing? Shit, 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 (laughs) shit, 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 shit. At that point, I think I decided to become a theologian. <laughs> and you know what I knew at that point? That can't be, that could be sin, but it can't be the deeper aspect of what the Bible's talking about with sin. To be sure, it's a violation, you know, of your speech should be in, in accord with God, right? But that can't be what Jesus Christ died for only, right? Yes. very soon. (laughs) Yeah, well, we got to define, let's define what we're repenting over first, and then we'll talk about, then we're going to... Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So this term, this term in the scripture is the term hamartia. You've probably heard that before. As a matter of fact, the and I, I like this joke. I'm the expert on hamartia. I'm the expert in sin. It's a theology joke. 
right? <laughs> that went, we may get it on the ride home. Um, hamartia, you guys, means to miss the mark. That's what it means. It's an it's a, it's a archery term. You've missed the mark. What, what have we missed the mark on? Well, I think it's instructive, don't you think? Let's look at what the first, t- first instance and in where this term occurs in the whole Bible. The Bible uses this term a lot, sin. What's the first instance? Those, does anyone who doesn't go to church know? Does anyone know where the first time this word occurs? Any, well, okay, anyone know? Genesis 4. Now, Genesis 3, very much like he just said, talks about the, what happens, you know, and the fall, so to speak. We talked about the term the fall two weeks ago, too, which was a, which was a term used by my beloved Augustine. And I said Augustine intentionally. But the first time the word sin occurs in the whole Bible is the next chapter. And so you start to see a lot by how the Bible lays things out chronologically, you start to learn a little bit too. Because in chapter 3 in the garden, the term, to be sure we're talking about sin in Genesis 3, but the term isn't used there. It's used in 4. And so Genesis 3, do you know what it does, you guys? In the garden, it chronicles the broken relationship vertically. And then Genesis 4 shows you how the broken relationship vertically starts to impact everything horizontally around you. And so you're broken vertically, and the very next chapter is you have brother murdering brother. And that's where it occurs. And watch where it occurs, and in the context of where it occurs. And you're going to learn a lot about this term. Cain and Abel. Abel offers right sacrifice to God, <laughs> which is we consider first fruits. Cain offers what? Leftovers to God, which implies a faith condition of, of, of faithfulness and faithlessness here. Because Abel offers first fruits to God, that means he trusts God. Obviously, it's an indication at least to some degree, right? That he trusts God with everything. He trusts God with his finances, trusts God with with his life, trusts God with his relationships. He gives God the first fruits of his existence. Cain doesn't. And it says, and the Lord did not accept Cain's offering. Do you remember this? And do you remember what, I'll just read it for you here, what God says to Cain when Cain is upset. Now Cain gets upset. Here. It says in Genesis 4, 5, I'll read this to you. But for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Who's he angry with? God did not receive. Cain obviously thought the offering was okay when he offered it. And God didn't accept it. And then Cain became angry and his face fell. Who's he really angry with here? I think he's really angry with with God himself. Because look at what God says to him next. I'll just read it to you. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. You've seen this before, especially in little kids. My, my kids in athletics, Kim, right? They do it all the time. When they miss a shot, miss a tackle, strike out. Whew, right? That's what happens with Cain. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, we got to define what that means, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. And its desire is to have you. First time the word's mentioned, right there. Sin is crouching at your door. Now is that shoot? Damn it, S-H-I-T, F-U-C-K. Is that what he's talking about? No, No, that's not what he's talking about. Is he talking about, oh, violating a commandment? Well, I think all those get included, but I think 
Wouldn't you agree with me that God here is talking about something much deeper than just a surface behavior? It's not just me. Pretty much every Christian commentator for 2,000 years says that. And the, how sin is depicted, hamartia, missing the mark, God says it's, it crouches. Well, there's a little bit more work we need to do. What, why do animals in the, why do predatory animals crouch? To pounce, but also to do what? To hide. And what God is saying to Cain is this. He says, sin has you by the throat and you can't even see it. Huh? So whatever that condition is of sin, that hamartia, it has you by the throat. And Cain, you don't see it. So the first condition of sin that we know of is that it's a breach with God, back to Hope's point. There's brokenness. This is scriptural now. Sin implies or tells us that there's something broken with us in relationship to God. Usually, it's unbeknownst to us. Huh? And what else? It makes us at odds with God. There's enmity. It, there's strife. Uh, we're, we're against him, right? And so when we start to define that term, we have to get way deeper than saying breaking a commandment or two. It's way deeper than that. Think about it like this. Sins are symptoms. Sin is the disease, right? So if I had, I always use this analogy, some of you are familiar with it. If I had brain cancer, would I have symptoms eventually, obviously? What would be some symptoms? Headache, blurry vision, seizures. Uh, now, if I had a headache that was due to a severe brain tumor that was going to kill me and I took an ibuprofen that made the headache go away, I'd, I may be even in more danger. Why? Because I think whatever's hurting me is gone. Sins, <laughs> disobedience, right? Breaking a commandment, cussing, uh, stealing, lying, cheating. Those are sins. Those are symptoms of a deeper condition, of a deeper, of a, of a deeper tumor, of a cancer. What's giving birth to that is what God is talking about. What gives birth to the disobedience? What gives birth to the anger against God, wanting to take matters into your own hands, being upset that he's not accepting your offering. What is that? And if you just backpedal a little farther into Genesis chapter 3, you will see exactly what that is. Exactly. Genesis 4 gives you the repercussions and a little bit of a view of the heart. Genesis 3 gives you the whole picture of what it is. Luther looks at Genesis 3, and if you haven't read his lectures on Genesis, they are just absolutely worth their weight in gold. The woman has a word from God. The man and the woman have a word from God. Now, you've got to remember, I've heard people say, well, that darn Adam and Eve, it's like the story isn't about just two spiritual parents, ancestors, it's about you and me. You are Adam, you are Eve. It's a story of us. So, they have a word from God, don't eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. But then you realize, didn't we talk about this last week? That God, God is not the only one who talks in the Bible. The man spoke, right? This is a, he responded, this is now flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. I shall call her woman. But there's another entity that speaks. Yeah. And the, the serpent, the devil says, did God really say? So the first step towards sin is to get you to doubt the state of sin, look, is to get you to doubt and to not believe or not trust the word that God has proclaimed to you concerning his son, Jesus Christ, to our present state is where I'm at. It's doubt and un Luther defines sin as unfaith. Did God really say, and she repeats it back. She says, well, God said this. And he, but God said, when we do it, we'll die. And the devil says, you will not die. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Oh, there's another aspect to this prism that we're turning in different directions on this thing like sin. You can be him. You don't have to be under him. You don't have to work in the vineyard. You could be the owner of the vineyard. You don't have to steward your gifts. You could be the giver. You could be in charge. You can take control of your own life. You can muster up the strength for your own salvation. You could stand up on your own two feet. You can do it. You are the little engine that could. And you keep trying and don't listen to what he has to say about your salvation. You trust in you. You listen to your gut. You get, there's the work of the serpent, which is very much pop, new pop age wisdom, you know, modern age wisdom. Listen, you got to go with your gut. You got to listen to your, listen to your heart. You got to, uh, you, you have to trust you, right? I was about ready to break out into song, yeah. right? So the essence of sin, look at that. Yeah. Doubt, unfaith, trusting in other words, and why would, you do, why would you trust in the word of the serpent over the word of the Lord? Why? Because you will be like God. You can save yourself. You can be your own savior. And now you start to see that at the rock bottom core level, the foundational level of sin is the fact that you are in charge of you. And you can build up yourself. You can give, you could gain salvation. You can save yourself. That's at the core, right there. And it gets even nastier because the text says, after the devil said this to her, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for eating. That's a weird... Do you remember part of his temptation? He says, you shall be like God, what? Knowing good and evil. Well, here's a question. Before she ate, she was able to identify good because it says when she saw that the fruit of the tree was good, she knew good before she ate. Then what do you want to eat for? If the temptation is to be like God knowing good and evil and she already knows a good thing when she sees it, she already knows the good, then why does she want to eat? She wants to know evil. No, it's right there in the text. I know, it's gross. I know, it's gross. This is why our brains get scrambled. When we see this, we realize, you guys, that our self-salvationism in ourselves, when we fight it, it's the exact fight that happened in the garden. Why we don't... The pushback against it is we have vested interest. We're defending our own autonomy here for crying out loud. It me, I'm still in charge, aren't I? I still have the capabilities. I still have, I could still merit. I could still do this, right? It keeps you intact. Gerhard Ferdi used to say this, you guys. One of the, one of the, my teacher, seminary, one of the great ways to understand how someone looks at the gospel, if they look at it in a correct way, is if there's discontinuity of self. What he meant by that was, is that, if Jesus Christ does all the saving, that means that I don't at all. And that means that, that this part of us that wants to be like him, that wants to trust in ourself, that wants to listen to other words, that self has to die. Right? If, if you trust in Jesus Christ, you don't trust in yourself. You're not trying to be like God anymore. You're not trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and earn your salvation. If you trust in him, all that goes away. And so Luther used to say that we have a vested interest in the gospel not being true because it leaves us intact. It gives us some little bit, however small it is, it leaves us I'm a continually existing subject still. You know who expresses this most beautifully, ironically enough, is a Catholic short story novelist named Flannery O'Connor. Have any, any of you ever heard of her, Flannery O'Connor? You need to read her stuff. Great biography if you want to read it. It's called The Habit of Being, which is very much Aristotelian. But she has a story called The Misfit. 
This is my fate. Well, it's my second favorite story. My favorite short story of hers is called Revelation. And she's a southern novelist. And uh, anyway, there's a story about the misfit. It's this guy that escapes from jail, and he ends up coming across an old church lady. Not that any of you qualified of, under that term, but uh, you know what I'm. But you know what I'm talking about. Self righteous, self righteous. You know. Uh, well, anyway, she gets taken captive by this prisoner that's escaped from jail, and she starts to. She starts to get the gospel because she, her life is under threat. Right, and and it's amazing how having a gun pointed at your head brings things into perspective, right? Um, I don't really care about the insurance seminar anymore, right? The important things begin to get important when it's life and death. It's like when you have a child and it's life or death, it's like things get, the perspective gets really clear, right? The, the, whether or not how much your, your car tabs cost doesn't, doesn't bring anxiety anymore, right? Because something is more important, right? So her life the misfit has a gun to her, and she starts to talk about Jesus. And you know what the misfit says about Jesus Christ? He says, the way I look at it, and he's correct, watch this. The way I look at it is, the misfit says to the woman, he says, is that Jesus Christ has done thrown everything off kilter. He screwed everything up. And she goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, if he is who he said he is, and he did what the Bible said he did, that has saved us in this way. If Jesus Christ is who he said he is and saved us apart from anything that we've done, he says, then I'm owned by him and there's nothing left for me to do but fall down on his feet and worship him. There's nothing left. I've lost all options. There's no, the fight is over. The war is over. The striving is over. Uh, there's nothing left for me to do is if he is who he said he is. And then he says, and if he's not who he said he is, there's nothing left for me to do but do whatever I want, like rob or steal or kill or do whatever I want. Jesus Christ has screwed everything up. He's made the whole basis of existence binary. Either he is who he said he is, and he's, he's him, or he's not, and you live however you see fit. But it can't be a mixture of both of those. And that's exactly right. Jesus Christ has thrown everything off kilter. And for us to stay intact, if he is who he said he is, we don't survive. <laughs> his word goes. His salvation goes. There's no more self-salvation. There's no more pulling yourself. There's no more autonomy. There's no more, I will live my dreams and blah, 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 blah. It's all him now. And there's nothing. You're dead. So when you trust in him, you're trusting against yourself, which makes trusting in him really hard because your old self, the one that wants to live for self and the one that wants to be like God, doesn't give up very easily, you guys. It wants your old self that loves itself, wants to stay intact, wants to survive. And so one of the ways that your old self will survive and will say, okay, 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 okay. I know you've been raised from the dead. I know you're the living Lord of the universe. But I'm going to do my part, right? And he says, no, it is finished. Not completely finished. I mean, I still can, like, pray my way to salvation a little bit, right? No, nothing. Well, don't I have to, like, maybe be a better church guy and go be an awesome church attender? Uh, well, I think that's a good idea, but no, that doesn't save you anymore. Only trusting in me saves you. What's left for you to do? What's left in terms of the old sinner? I'm talking about the old sinner in us that wants to live for self. You're utterly incapacitated. You're, you're dead. This is why discontinuity is the mark of true gospel identity. Discontinuity. Continuity, whereas the old self still remains intact and still can contribute and still can climb up and still can perform. Continuity is the basis of Pelagianism. Discontinuity is the basis of the gospel. So 
What are we repenting of? Well, that's to Milano's question. Metanoia. What does that mean? Meta. Meta. Noia, mind, meta, change. It's a changing of the mind. About what? What are we changing our mind about? You're changing your mind, which I just told you feels a lot like death and resurrection. (laughs) What does repentance feel like? I had someone ask me that. How do I know if I've repented totally? What does it feel like? I said, it feels like death. Uh... And if you know, like, you've been near death, that's exactly what it feels like. So much so that when you're brought into Christ Jesus, Luther called that the big death. And he says, your physical expiration at the end of time is just, that. he calls that the little death. That's the easy part. The real loss of self occurred in the the gospel when Jesus Christ claims you and makes you his own. That's where the real self-loss is gone, where it occurs. This is why the Apostle Paul talks this way nonstop. Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in, with, who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I'm a dead man walking. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For if justification could come through the law, then Jesus Christ died for nothing. Discontinuity. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's all over the Scripture. And so what are we repenting of? You're repenting of saving yourself. <laughs> You're repenting of Cain thinking his offering could make him right before God. You're repenting of what C.S. Lewis called it, un, or uh, Luther called it unfaith. C.S. Lewis calls it pride, trust in self. Al Pacino in The Devil's Advocate calls it vanity, love of self. It's very easy to build a Christian scheme of salvation based on vanity, based on unfaith, based on pride. I just showed it to you. It's called medieval scholasticism or any other philosophy or theology other than the gospel. So you're, rep- you're repenting. Here's the difference between a Christian and a, and a Muslim and a Hindu and a whatever. A Christian and a Muslim and a Jew walk into a bar. <laughs> no, a, uh, uh, a Muslim, Jew, Hindu, they will all repent of their immorality. I screwed up, I suck, you know, that. A Christian not only repents of their immorality, they repent of their morality. They repent of Phariseeism. They repent of thinking that their efforts and their, their, their behavior, their whatever, before God gets them anywhere with him. They repent of that. And so you guys, yeah, we could say sin is disobedience. Yeah, sin, but it's Underneath the disobedience is, is a tumor of pride, of unfaith, of trust in self, of taking matters into your own hands, of being like God. That's all from the text. And, it's, and even more so, chances are you can't even see the self-salvationism that's in you. This is why these counselors at this school make so much money is because they want to diagnose that. They could see the (laughs) self-salvationism, right? You build your identity on something other than Jesus Christ. That's self-salvationism. It could be career, it could be romance, it could be all sorts. It could be religion. You build your life on being a good person and being obedient to God. That's not on Jesus Christ. That's building your, building your image or yourself or your salvation upon you. And look at what the gospel does. When your salvation is completely given to you by Jesus Christ, look at relationships now can be relationships again. They don't have to be pseudo-saviors to, make, to give you a sense of salvation. Money could be money again. It doesn't have to be your Lord that somehow or another is going to give you a sense of salvation. Church could be church again. A spouse could be a spouse again. Sports could be sports. And it, so the gospel frees you up to go into these things now freely as a child of God, wanting to be obedient to him rather than having to to attain something. And guess what? Those, those people who think that they are attaining, they have to do something to to somehow or another merit God's favor. If you want to talk good works, the people who believe they're saved by grace through faith and their good works don't merit them anything, do way more good works than the people that think they have to do good works to get to heaven. Did that make sense? (laughs) 
The people who were freed from works do a lot of work. And the people who still think that they have to typically don't do much. This is why Luther, when he wanted to save himself, what's the first thing that he did? Did good works to advance himself. And see, because sin is so damn tricky and so deceptive and so serpentine and so predatory, we can't even see it. This is why when the gospel comes to us that God had to send a Savior, the first reaction might be, who needs saving? I'm doing okay. I've had, I've had people say that to me. I've said, your sin is forgiven for Jesus' sake. Well, who asked him to do that? I said, oh, hello, Genesis 3 and 4. That's in all of us. That's all of us. Well, who asked him to do that? Who needs saving? I'm fine just by myself. Religion's a people, religion is for those who need a crutch. Uh, here, here, my favorite 19th century philosopher who I loathe, but he's, uh, I like to make fun of him. Karl Marx, religion is an opiate. What's an opiate? A drug for the masses, right? It gives people... A, it gives them a buzz so they could feel better about their sucky lives is what he's saying, right? Well, yeah, your life may suck, but you get heaven in the end. Now relax and be a good little citizen. <laughs> Savior, this is why Marx does not understand the gospel, and this is why I, I'm almost fully convinced you can't be a Marxist and be a Christian at the same time, but that's a whole nother, whole nother topic. Savior. And when you realize you're saved, you could enter back into the things of this world freely rather than under compulsion to save yourself. It frees you up, Luther said. Here's a quote from Martin Luther, to be a person of this world and for it. So now your good works can be used for your neighbor's sake rather than a spiritual advancement's sake for yourself. You could save a little boy, walk, walk someone across the street for the woman who needs walking across the street rather than you thinking you're being obedient, you're somehow proving your justification. My God, who, who wants to be around someone who thinks that they're going to prove their salvation by how nice they could be to me? C.S. Lewis always said, you could always tell the people that are self-salvationers and, and are under compulsion to do good works. He says, just look at their family and their friends and you could see the tormented looks on their faces. Oh, saints that are, people that are trying to be saints based on their own strength and based on something other than the gospel usually are super tormenting to people. They're hard to be around, right? How many of you like Bo? You coach football. I never knew this until I was a coach, but kids who are suck-ups are super annoying, right? Because I know what you're doing and I know it's fake and I know you're only doing it because I'm watching. It's gross, <laughs> it's fake. And that's what typically happens is when we, when we command salvation by works and merits and we have to do this, all we do is we don't make real Christians, we just make fake saints. That's sin. And so when we repent, when we metanoia, we're saying, I repent <laughs> of not trusting in your word and I'm going to... By your, by, give me your Holy Spirit so that I will trust your word. I'm repenting of trying to take salvation into my own doggone hands. I'm repenting of my unfaith. I'm repenting of my pride. I'm repenting of my vanity. And I am a child of the cross plus nothing. Nothing. That's it. This is why my favorite story is that old thief on the cross. And we say, well, that, that, that was under extenuating circumstances. Of course it always is for self-salvationers. The guy can't even scratch his own nose. And what does he say to Jesus Christ? Look at this. This is beautiful. You remember this where there's two thieves? <laughs> Here, I'll show you what salvation looks like. Here, this story and this story alone. Jesus Christ is crucified between two thieves. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, both of them were deriding Jesus. Both of them were talking trash. In Luke... You get a perspective of another one of the, uh, You get another perspective, which is really interesting. Jesus is between two of them. The thief, the bad thief over here. We'll call him the bad thief, right? The unrepentant thief. He says to Jesus Christ, um, "Hey, you said you're the Messiah. Uh, messiahs don't die. Messiahs are supposed to save. 
So prove you're the Messiah. And the guy says, what? Save yourself. But then he adds, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He adds a little conjunction with a pronoun after he says to Jesus, save yourself. He goes, and me. <laughs> in other words, I'll trust in you if you can get me out of the trouble. Hmm? Second thief says, looks at him and says, don't you fear God? We are on this cross and sadly enough, we deserve it. We are suffering justly for what we have done. And then he looks at Jesus and he says, but this man has done no wrong. Then he says, one little prayer, Jesus, and by the way, he's the only guy, the only person in all four gospels who only refers to Jesus as simply Jesus. Isn't that weird? Now, the omniscient narrator, who is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they call Jesus Jesus, but I'm talking someone who addresses him, right? Jesus. Everyone's usually son of David, rabbi, teacher, you know. He says, Jesus, remember me hmm? when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, well, I'm going to do way more than that. I'm going to do way more than just recollect. He says to him, very, Jesus goes, very truly I say to you. And when Jesus Christ says, very truly I say to you, you might want to trust it. <laughs> That's a check that's going to go through. <laughs> right? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, very truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now let me blow your circuits even more. When Jesus says, uh, today you will be with me in paradise, did you know that's the only time that Jesus Christ uses the word paradiso, paradise, in the whole Gospels? That's the only time on the cross in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Well, I have an idea. Because Jesus Christ always says uh, eternal life, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. He uses those terms over and over and over again, right? Are you with me, everyone? You're not falling asleep? Okay, why does moments, we're talking minutes, maybe an hour before Christ's own death, does he use that term that he never uses anywhere else? Why? Obviously, it's intentional, right? It's not just like, Hey, I guess I've never used this word before. I better bust it out right now. I haven't said it yet, and I kind of got to say it because I'm running out of time. Uh, paradise! Well, if you study the literature, you will know that what we're referring to here, where did all that occur in Genesis 3 and 4? Yep. First century Jews called that paradise. That was the common usage. I mean, they said Eden and all those, but paradise was a reference back to not just the garden itself, but the state of union with God, right? Where before sin, before stuff got, you know, before the dark times, before the empire, right? Obi-Wan Kenobi, got me. Um, um, paradise, Jesus never uses that term until the cross. And what, it, what happened in paradise to begin with? You had two thieves <laughs> that stole something that didn't belong to them. Correct? Adam and Eve. And here, however many years later, is God himself between two latter-day descendants of those people, thieves on the cross, in between two thieves. And Jesus Christ says, what happens also at the end of Genesis 3 when God kicks him out of the garden? He closes paradise. It's one of the most badass descriptions in all the scripture because not only does he kick him out, he closes, the, he sh you know, he shuts it and God puts an angel in front of it with a lightsaber. <laughs> what does it say? A flaming sword. Right? Yeah, so, so a lightsaber. Like, no one's getting back into paradise. Think about it. Now, think about it deep in the heart. You're not getting back into paradise. 
vroom, vroom, there's a flaming sword. And to get back into paradise, you have to go through the sword. And here sits God himself, right? Underneath the sword. And he says to one thief, very truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's reopened. He sits between two thieves, two latter-day descendants of Adam, of Adam and Eve and says, paradise is open because of what I've done. Two guys get paradise open, restored, to quote John Milton, right? Paradise lost, paradise restored. They can't do anything except trust. Can't scratch their nose. Nothing minutes from death. And you guys, no one in the New Testament gets more certainty of their salvation than that unnamed thief. So much so that there was one writer, William Williman, he was a, uh, he's a dirty Methodist, but um, uh, William Williman imagined that when Jesus Christ, after he dies, <laughs> shows up in heaven and says, and goes to God the Father, and he says, and God the Father says, well, son, what did you accomplish in those 33 years? What do you have to show for all that work of saving the whole cosmos, right? And Jesus Christ walks in with a thief missing teeth, right? This guy, truly I tell you, today would be with me in paradise. No teeth, ragged clothes, looks like he just rolled in from underneath the, the overpass on 6th Ave. And Jesus says, Father, I got this guy. <laughs> it's, it shows you the gospel. What do you have to do to qualify for paradise? Well, you have to be a thief. <laughs> and that's called repentance. You admit that I'm trying to steal from God, that I'm trying to be my own savior, that I'm trying to merit, I'm trying to earn it, I'm trying to do things in the Franks and I did it my way, I'm, and I repent of that. Come into my life, give me the gospel, and I wanna trust in your justifying word rather than the words of my own heart. That's repentance. That's repentance. Um, Metanoia, and that's when, when we talk about faith in Christ, the New Testament word is pistis. I know, little kids laugh when I say that because he said, you just said piss. It's uh, pistis. Uh, but what it means in the New Testament is more like our English word trust. So when I say faith, we tend to think like, oh, I believe something's true, right? Uh, like the sky is blue or like... Uh, or, uh, you know, I believe there is a God. That, that's how we think of faith. Now, when I say to you, do you trust God? That sounds different, doesn't it? Certainly does, right? Do you trust your spouse? Do you trust, right? Do you trust God, right? And I hate to do this, but I quote the, the, the Kate Winslet in the movie Titanic, who, who plays, you know, Rose and Jack. And you remember as the ship is sinking, he says, do you trust me? And she reaches out his, her hand and she says, what? I trust you, right? It's that kind of thing. Trust with God is just like that. The ship is going down. Do you trust me? The hand is out. Uh, Dr. Ferdy used to say, faith in Jesus Christ, the only thing in this life that's closest to it is uh, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife or do you take this man? And you say, I do. And when you say, I do, Life can't be the same anymore. There's a pre-you, there's a you before marriage, there's a you after marriage, right? Yeah. There's discontinuity. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And take that, take that marriage aspect, guys, times it times a trillion, and you have what the, the trust commitment, when you trust God's word, when you trust Jesus, I trust you. And that's hard to do because you have to trust against yourself. So much so that in the book of Romans, Paul says, God has to give you his Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 14 says it too. God has to give you his Holy Spirit so that you can trust because you won't because we have vested interest. We, we have self-preservation vested interest to not trust him because we want to stay in control. And when he died for you and he's the Lord, that means you're not in control anymore. Oh, we're way past time. I mean... 
I just, I, well, we're going to, I'm going to finish this chart next time. Um, but I will say this about Scripture really quick. If you look at Scripture on the left, Scripture is its own authority, and this will make sense. I'll be 30 seconds, you guys, but you've got to pay attention, or I'm going to keep going. <laughs> scripture alone is our authority. Scripture interprets itself. Why is that important? Because if there's an authority above Scripture, that means it has to be human. If it's not God, what is it? Well, the papacy would say it's the Pope, right? The Pope stands alongside Scripture authoritatively. Well, that means that there's some sort of human effort involved in God's Word coming to us, which kind of sounds like works righteousness. Kind of sound, Do you see how justification, this is my point, how justification, it fans out into every doctrine. Justification by faith alone through Christ alone, it leaves no rock unturned of all of Christian theology. It goes into everything. It goes into It goes into soteriology, I mean, the sacraments, everything, how you look at Scripture. It goes into all of that. And and, uh, anyway, this is critical to see that, that this is why Ernst Kazemann, 20th century, great biblical, one of the top biblical scholars of the 20th century that said justification by faith alone is a fighting doctrine. I love that. It's a fighting doctrine. That means it fights all its competitors off so that it could stand alone. And you know who else? Walter von Lohenick. He's a great uh, Luther scholar, said that, and you could only know the, ju- the doctrine of justification by faith alone, through Christ alone, through his death and resurrection alone. You only know it in self-loss. You, don't, you can't know it in self-fullness. You only know it in self-loss. And this, this is why, Nestigan always used to say, this is why the people at your church that get the gospel the quickest are the ones that have lost self maybe in some aspect in their life. Your alcoholics, right? Your addicts, they get it. They get powerlessness. Yes, sir. Well, I think ultimately the standard would have come back to the law itself, which would have told him, right? Obviously, Abel knew. But here's the thing with people like Abel. Abel probably didn't even need to be told that God should be his first fruits. People that are so captured by the love of God, they usually don't need to be told, well, if you really love God, you'll do this better. They just, they just do right? So obviously there had some, been some sort of standard set in Genesis chapter 4 with offering, and the offering is not to get salvation, but I think the level of the offering shows how much salva- if salvation is in you or not. And I think it showed that it was in Abel and it wasn't in Cain, if that makes sense. And that's exactly what the law is supposed to do. The law, God's law, is a wonderful, perfect diagnostic tool that shows you your spiritual condition. You didn't give the offering. You should have. You didn't. It was halfway. And God tries to show him. Bad Cain. And is there any repentance? No. Not at all. You know, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you an example real quick before we go. Of one who gets the law who knew the standard and was this story in spades. David. David is called a man after God's own heart, wrote two-thirds of the Psalms, and is the chief progenitor and ancestor of the Messiah. And this is a guy who was so blind, who was so full of unfaith, who was so full of vanity, and so the, the man after God's own heart, 
so full of pride that he was able to sleep with his best friend's wife and impregnate her and then knowingly murder his best friend. By the way, who is the daughter of Eliab, but who is also one of David's mighty men, Bathsheba's dad. Now, let me ask you a real diagnostic question. How does someone not know what they're doing when they're doing that? How does a man after God's own heart not know that he's absolutely in utter alienation from God's heart at that point? How, how do you not know? Sin crouches. Sin. Sin. Sin crouches. You know what it is? You don't know you're doing it, but oh, when, the, when, you, when the law comes, you, know, you don't know, but you know. Right? It's crouching. The sin that has you by the throat is the one you can see the least. Is seeing it. That you actually see it for what it is. I remember, as Tim Keller has said, after 30 years of ministry in the church, people would come to him and thousands of people would come to him, all kinds of problems, confess all kinds of things, all kinds of things. And he said, but it's not interesting after 30 years, nobody has ever come to me and confessed that they're greedy or prideful. Yeah. yeah. It's like everything else, but not. So, it, so nobody. I know, Mike, I was probably going through unfaith, vanity, pride, and I bet people are sitting here, you're sitting there saying, that's not me. That's not me. I know, that's exactly what sin tells you. It's not you. That's the problem. David didn't think, being a sinner, he thought he was a powerful king of his stuff. That's how he saw himself perfection. So what the law does, this is critically important, is it shows you. It shows you who you really are. It's not there to save you, but it is to show you who you really are to get you to salvation. This is like Charlie Brown. Do you remember? Uh, he goes to Lucy. Dr. Tilly had loved this. Charlie Brown, remember Lucy? You put a nickel in the can and she'll do uh, pop counseling psychology for you, right? Do you remember this with Charlie Brown? Put in, oh, the nickel. What a wonderful noise, she would say. And Charlie Brown confesses her, his problems to her. And she goes, you know what? I finally figured it out, Chuck. The problem with you, she says to Charlie Brown, is that you're you. And Charlie Brown goes, well, what am I supposed to do about that? And she goes, I'm the therapist. I only point out the problems. I don't have the solutions. <laughs> That's what the law does. And so guess what? David is in such self-deception. It's crazy. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, I was just doing this Bible study with a group of teenagers, and they couldn't believe that this story's in the Bible. They were like, are you kidding me? He murdered, he slept with his best friend's wife knowingly, impregnated her, and then murdered his best friend? How, how? The, and I said, and I, it gets worse. This is called a, the model guy after God's own heart. They're like, what sort of book is this? This is insane. And I said, look, it's better what happens next because God does what he always does with people that are, <laughs> where sin is crouching and they can't see. He sends someone he sends the law. He sends a preacher. <laughs> what did he do with Nineveh? Sent a preacher. What does he do with David? Sends a preacher. What does he do with John the Baptist to the people of Israel in the Judean countryside? Sends a preacher. I don't know why he does it, but he likes to send, in, send infallible people to, to, give a, to give his word. But, or fallible people, I should say. So Nathan comes. And Nathan comes to David, and he tells David a parable. But David doesn't know he's hearing a parable. And as far as I can tell you guys, there's lots of metaphor in the Old Testament. This is the only parable that's in the Old Testament. Jesus told parables all the time. He's just, he's uh, paraboling, he's just jingle belling all the way, paraboling all over the place. Nathan comes to David and he says, hey, king, which wouldn't have been abnormal to have the king adjudicate a case of, of injustice and wrongdoing. He comes to David and he says, hey, there's this guy, super rich dude, crazy rich dude, who has tons of lambs, which have been like lots of money in his pocket. And he says, and there was a poor guy. Poor, there is a poor guy. And he has one ewe lamb. This rich guy had millions. 
This poor guy had one U, E-W-E, means it's a female, it's a dot, and, it, and he says, and this U lamb uh, was more than just uh, a lamb to him. It used to sit in his lap and eat of his meager fare, right? Eat from his table, played with his children. It's, and Nathan says, and that lamb was like a daughter to him, and you all know pets like this, right? How they could become family, right? And David's like, okay. And, and Nathan says, and you know what happened one day? The rich man who had millions of lambs wanted to throw a big Super Bowl party. And he invited all his friends to the Super Bowl party. And they came over and instead of using his, one, of the millions of his, one of the million lambs that he has to cook dinner, he went and took Benji and Lassie and killed the little ewe lamb that played with the poor man's children and slaughtered it and ate it. And David goes, text says, David fumed with anger. Who is this man, he says. He says, he will pay back th threefold what he has done. And then David says this, and he deserves to die. Payback threefold would have been normal law. Just capital punishment would have been way over the top. Super excessive. And you know what the Hebrew scholar Robert Alter says? Why is David saying he deserves to die? An excessive punishment. Why? He says, because David's conscience is waking up. He, was, he didn't see what he has done, and he sees an injustice, and this thing has been eating at him, what he's done, and it's starting to wake up, you guys, which is typically why you see people that are doing sordid, nasty, bad things, and no one knows about it, right? And yet, and they get overly pissed and upset if someone's like late to a meeting or the, his wife didn't pick up the right jar of mayonnaise from the grocery store. You're no good. This is terrible. You, I'm divorcing you, right? It's over the top. It's excessive. Why? Because there's a greater sin that they've done that's eating them up. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. David's conscience is waking up. That's why he's pronouncing such harsh judgment on this guy. And David says, who is this man? And Nathan, in a line that would make John Wayne jealous, looks at him and says, you are the man. And they, boom, the law. It's you. And then Nathan says, thus says the Lord. Whew, I get chills just hearing this. I made you king over the house of Judah, right? I made you king over the house of Saul. I gave your enemies into your hands. I gave your enemies' wives into your hands. I gave you treasure. I gave you success. And if, and if that had been too little, I would have given you much more, God says. Why then have you despised the Lord by doing what is evil in his sight? And then God says, you killed Uriah the Hittite. Not, not the Assyrians or whoever, you, the, the Amalekites. You killed him. And when David here's the word of judgment, the word of the law. Do you know what he does? Now this, and we'll end with this, is what makes David great. Not his military prowess, not that he was good looking, not that he was a skilled musician, not that he was all these things. This is what makes King David a man after God's own heart. After that proclamation is brought to him by the prophet of judgment, David goes, I've sinned against the Lord. Most kings don't do that. They would just say, so? I'll do whatever I want. David repents. That's what makes him great, you guys. And that's what he's, do you want to see what he's repenting over? We're going to, okay. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I'll just read this and then I'll say amen and we'll go. After Nathan, and do you know as soon as David repents, do you know what Nathan, David says, I've sinned against the Lord. Do you know what Nathan says to him then? Your sin is forgiven. That quick. The Lord has taken away your sin. In other words, it's like God couldn't get through to David until he brought this harsh judgment to make David see what David didn't want to see. And then finally when David saw it and he repented it, he said, I'm sorry, Lord, I love you. God goes, I love you too. I just, I just needed to get your heart. Your heart was gone. I, didn't, I don't like hammering you with judgment, but I couldn't get to your heart unless I showed you what your heart really looked like. I love you too. And David goes and he writes this. Right after this, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. 
According to your abundant mercy, blot out my sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, right? Second Samuel chapter 11 is he didn't even know what he was doing, sleeping with his best friend's wife and murdering his best friend. Now I know and my sin is ever before me. And it's not even against Uriah. You, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified in your sentence. I'm guilty. You're right. One scholar said repentance is just believing, believing what God has said about you. <sighs> He goes on, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me in a willing spirit. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in religious sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. But the sacrifice that's acceptable to you, O Lord, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise law and gospel, law and gospel, law and gospel. We thank you, Lord. We love you. And we give you uh, all the praise and all the glory. Thank you for your son, Jesus. He's everything. He's him. And so, Father, may we fall at his feet and worship him. And then knowing our salvation, that we could be some earthly good to serve our neighbor, to serve those in need, to serve those less fortunate, to serve those who are oppressed, to, to bind up the brokenhearted, Lord. Um, to spend ourselves for the sake of uh, our neighbor. Hmm. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get out of here.